In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As I called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Mercifully hear our prayers, and having set us free from the bonds of our sins, deliver us from every evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the Sunday called Quinquagesima is written in the first book of Samuel, chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you are to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send, him, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. With your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. The second lesson is written in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory be to you, Lord. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his height and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Look, Jesus said, we're going up to Jerusalem. And there are some things that you need to know before we go. It wasn't the first time Jesus had spoken such ominous words to his disciples. It was actually the third and the last. For within a week, he would be dead. But before they walked into it with him, he wanted them to know what was going to happen there and why. Look, we're heading into Lent. And there are some things that you should know before we do. We've done it before. The church has been doing it for thousands of years. You even know where and when and how it's all going to end. But before we start down this road, let's see and let Jesus show us something about what he's going to do and why. The fact that the disciples didn't understand what Jesus told them was not for lack of clarity on Jesus' part. We who know how the story goes recognize that this is exactly the way that it turned out. He was handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Happened exactly that way. And Jesus wasn't being creative when he said that this was just like the prophets said either. Isaiah, likewise, was just as clear. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, pierced, crushed, wounded, slaughtered, and after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life, Isaiah said. The words are crystal clear. There's no ambiguity either in the words of the prophets or of Jesus. It wasn't their words, after all, that gave the troubles, the, the apostles trouble. It was their meaning. It was their significance. Why is Jesus going to be handed over and mocked and insulted and spit upon and killed? But perhaps that explains why Jesus is taking them with him. Jesus said, we are going up to Jerusalem. Why did they need to go? Why why couldn't he go alone? He's the one who is going to suffer and die. And eventually he is going to go all alone. Because the twelve are going to flee though some will watch from a distance. It's not something that they're going to want to see. But if they don't understand it now, how will they ever understand it? Unless they go with him to Jerusalem, unless they see him sweating in the garden, unless they see him under arrest and on trial, unless they see him bloodied, bruised, and see his lifeless body. Even on Easter morning, they didn't realize it at all until they saw him. Admittedly, Lent is not the most pleasant time of the church year. If we had our way, I think we would probably skip it altogether. We'd skip the talk of ashes, the absence of alleluias, skip the extra services and the solemnity. We'd rather get on to the good stuff like the lilies and the alleluias of Easter. We'd rather not go to Jerusalem or spend so much time in Lent. But we go into Lent for the same reason, I think, that Jesus took his disciples with to Jerusalem. For we would never really understand it, understand the why Jesus had to go unless we saw it. Intellectually, we know what it's all about. Jesus died for our sins. But who could really understand that? And understand exactly how much it cost him unless we see it for ourselves. If, so if you think that sin isn't that big of a deal, try living without it for 40 days. You don't think that your sinful flesh is that strong? Try denying it something, anything. You think your faith is strong? Try watching and praying for just one hour. And you think that you would never deny him, run away from him, 
ask yourself if the people who run into you would ever recognize you as belonging to him because they never saw you with him. Go to Jerusalem during Lent and see what your sin did. Go into Lent and see what your sin does. See, Lent doesn't allow us to just go on with our lives blissfully ignorant of what is really happening in Jerusalem. Look, we're going. And we're going to see what happened to Jesus. It's the only way that the truth will be unhidden from us. It's the only way for us to come face to face with the reality of our sin. Lent forces us to take our sin seriously. Because there we see, nowhere else, there we see what God did with it. And you can't really understand it. I don't think a person can possibly understand the depth of their guilt before God until he sees it resting squarely on Jesus' shoulders. Until you see it pouring from his wounds. And you can't possibly understand the significance of Jesus' resurrection until you see that his death was actually yours. But you don't actually have to go to Jerusalem to see this reality for yourselves. And you don't even have to watch a graphic movie depicting Christ's passion to see what your sin did to Jesus. Because it stands written. Written for you in Holy Scriptures. It's written in, here in black and white. But that's the very word, then, that Lem puts in front of you. At least one purpose, a major purpose of the season of Lent is for more time in God's word. More time seeing what Jesus wants you to see there. And only then will you understand it. Midweek Vespers, daily devotion, Sunday divine service, all of those have a part to play in what Jesus wants you to see. But before you get to Jerusalem, before we get into Lent, there's something else that Jesus wants you to see. The disciples might not have understood everything that Jesus was saying to them about the suffering and death and resurrection and all of that, but, but they did understand the Jerusalem part. They knew what that meant, and they knew the way to Jerusalem, and so they got going. The Passover was coming up. Keep in mind that this event that we read today was just a couple days before Palm Sunday. And so the beginning of this procession here is the beginning of that procession that ends in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. The disciples knew that if they were going to get to Jerusalem by Palm Sunday, they, they need to keep on moving. But as Jesus is walking in the vicinity of Jericho, there comes this cry, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in the head of the procession saw that that cry came from a blind beggar, they rebuked him and told him to keep quiet. Maybe they said something like, we're on our way to Jerusalem, can't you see? We're in a hurry. And they thought that they were doing Jesus a favor by helping his procession along, get him to the cross a little bit early. But the man couldn't be quieted. Son of David, he cried out again, have mercy on me. And this time Jesus heard it and and Jesus stopped. Stopped everything that he was doing, and the, he had the man come to him and said to him, asked him, what do you want me to do for you? The man said, I want to see. How strange, his disciples must have thought. For Jesus just finished saying that he must go to Jerusalem. He had to go to Jerusalem, and it sounds very important. And so we're on our way on this important trip, and now Jesus at the cry of this blind, pathetic beggar, stops the whole thing, and Jesus talks to this wretched man like he's his servant. What would you like me to do for you? For some of us, I think we might sometimes treat the season of Lent the same way. Like maybe we're not... It's, totally sure we understand what it's all about, but the preacher says it's important, so tell me what do I need to do? Tell me what's my part. What do I got to do? 
Do I have to come to church more often during Lent? Do I have to give something up? Do I have to wear ashes on my forehead? For some of us, Lent Lent and preparation might consist primarily in in things like making sure that you would sign up for an Easter breakfast if such a thing exists anymore. Just doing our part. It surprises us, perhaps, that Jesus would, in fact, stop the whole thing, undo the whole thing, the parole procession, for some guy who can't do anything at all. He can't follow Jesus to Jerusalem. He can't do his part. He can't even come to to Jesus on his own. His condition is that he is entirely dependent upon the charity of strangers for his sustenance. He has nothing. He promises nothing. He just begs. He pleads. Have mercy. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus stops for those who recognize him not with their eyes or intellect, but with a heart of faith. They know full well that they can do nothing on their own. That they don't have anything to give to Jesus. They they know their disease and they recognize Jesus as one who may have mercy. They believed him when he said that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Lent is not for people who have it all together. But then again, neither is Jesus. Lent and Jesus are for people who know full well that they can't see. It's for people who know that they are at his mercy. It is for those who are broken, crushed, despairing, lonely, and sorrowful. It's for those who realize what the ashes mean. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. It's for the dying. And it's to them that Jesus stops everything and says, what do you want me to do? Because, see, I'm going to Jerusalem. And within a week, we'd find Jesus wrapping a towel around his waist to wash his disciples' feet, to do for them what no one else would. He promises them his body and his blood to give to them what no one else could. Only when Jesus gives this man his sight is he able to follow Jesus to Jerusalem. And if he did, if he would follow Jesus all the way to the end, then his newly healed eyes would finally see what Jesus really did for him and what Jesus really did for you. There's a reason why the phrase, Lord, have mercy, shows up so many times in our liturgy. In practically every single service, we either say it or sing it, sometimes multiple times. That is, that it is, it keeps our eyes of faith honest. To recognize that we are always, always in need of God's mercy. That it is always more important for us to receive mercy from Jesus than it is to do our part. Than it is to lead the way for at all times, and especially during Lent, Jesus stands among us as one who serves. That is faith. That receives from Jesus exactly what he has to give. It's why we go to Jerusalem. It's why we go through Lent. To see the weight of our sin laid upon our Savior. To see our great need. And to see our Jesus as one who serves. And now, now that you see Jesus thus, now let's go. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God,
Please stand for prayer. O Lord our God, you have opened the eyes of the blind to see and the ears of the deaf to hear. As we prepare to enter the season of Lent, open our eyes and ears anew through the preaching of your law and gospel to hear and see your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve your church and her ministers. Give to all pastors courage to embrace gladly the crosses of their office, that following their example, all Christians may also bear the reproach of the world, the attacks of Satan and the temptations of the flesh, in the confidence of Christ's redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the family and all godly Christian homes. Give parents diligence and persistence in their duties to teach the faith in word and example. Keep all children in the promise you made to them in their baptism. Let the patience, kindness, and endurance of Christian love have no end among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the state and its servants to all whom you have given authority, bestow also the wisdom needed to use it dutifully for the benefit of those under authority. Turn us from every evil in judgment, law, or action, and renew in us and our fellow citizens discernment and selflessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve us and all who call to you in any need, especially for Walter Tim Jr., who has been hospitalized, Give wisdom to his physicians. Grant him patient trust to await your help and healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve your holy communion and your son's blessed supper among us. Give contrition and faith to those who gather at this altar. Unite them in their confession of your, your truth and so bring them worthily to eat and to drink Christ's body and blood for their forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, what you foretold through the holy prophets has been fulfilled and accomplished in the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son. You have set forth his passion and resurrection as the firm foundation and content for our faith. Have mercy on us and open our eyes to be fixed on the Son of David at all times. Give us courage to follow him through all adversity and every assault of the devil to view his passion with repentant hearts and with delight, for by it you have redeemed us from all sin and evil. Comfort us with the certainty of Christ's resurrection, by which we too have the confidence of eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord, according to his institution, we, your servants, celebrate here before your divine majesty. With these, your holy gifts, the commemoration your Son has willed us to make. Remembering his blessed passion, mighty resurrection, and glorious ascension, we give you most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits he has secured for us. And we humbly ask you to grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of sins and all other benefits of his passion. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Peace, we pray in mercy, Lord. Peace in our time, O send us. For there is none on earth but you, none other to defend us. You only, Lord, can fight for us. Amen. Just wanted to mention quick, the reason that we're using the piano this morning is that the, the blower for the organ overheated a little bit this morning. Um, I think we've addressed the situation, hopefully, uh, but we wanted to give it a time to cool off and a rest before the hymn festival this afternoon so that it should be in working order for that. We hope that, it, that everything will be. And we also then hope that you will return uh, and join us for our third annual hymn festival this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, there will be a meal afterwards for those who wish to, to participate with that as well. God be with you. Mm -hmm. 